I invite you to take your Bibles, please, and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, we're in a series called What's the Church? And we're looking today at the subject, Biblical Respect for Authority. If you have a bulletin and you want to take some notes, there's an outline on the inside of your bulletin, and you can feel free to uh, fill that out, and you'll remember a lot more of the message because it's a true educational principle that we remember the most what we hear, see, and write down. That's a fact. And when I was in school taking notes, I didn't like that, but, you know, so I understand. I got it, you know. And if you don't want to take notes, it's fine. By the way, the notes, the complete notes are on the on the website, uh, usually by Monday. So if if you don't have time to write down some of the lists that I'll give you today, uh, you can get them online and uh, just go to the notes section under media and you'll find all of the notes there from all the messages. Let's, t let's say the big idea together, okay? Because this is a big idea that is very, very vitally important today, especially in our culture and society today. So let's say it out loud with me, if you would please. Respect for authority will bring harmony. Let's say it again. Respect for authority will bring harmony. Now, you don't have to be very smart to recognize that there's not much harmony. There's not much peace in society today, is there? No. Everywhere we look, we see antagonism, we see division, we see rebellion. We've got it in our marriages, husband and wives divorcing each other. We see our children rebelling against their parents. We've got employers, employees who are screaming at one another. And we have protesters that are in the streets rioting and demanding uh, their rights. And on and on the list goes. So there's not much harmony. And to get harmony, mankind has tried a lot of things. He's tried legislation. He's tried education. He's tried all kinds of approaches, but nothing seems to work. The Apostle Paul here gives his solution to the antagonisms in the home and in society, and that solution is regeneration. A new heart from God and a new submission to Christ and to one another. So I'd like to share quickly some verses with you that talk about that, and then we're going to jump in right into chapter 6 of Ephesians. Paul says in Ephesians 5.21, place yourselves under each other's authority out of respect for Christ. King James says it's submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of the Lord. And last week, Pastor AJ talked about submission, and that's a biblical principle. See? The problem in society today is that people don't like to submit to authority. It isn't just wives that don't like to submit to their husbands. People don't like to submit to anybody. It's like, I want to do my own thing. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Well, if you're a believer this morning, if you're a child of God, you can't get away from the commands of Scripture. You can disobey them, but you can't dodge them, see? Because this says that we are to submit ourselves to one another out of respect for Christ, Ephesians 5.33. But every husband must love his wife as he loves himself, and wives should respect their husbands. And what Paul tells us here is that spiritual harmony will begin in the lives of Christians who are submitted to the spiritual leadership of Christ and who love each other. Paul said it to the Colossians in Colossians 3.14. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And church, Romans 14, 19 says, so then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. In my utmost for his highest reading this morning, there was a great, great uh, word from Oswald Chambers. And if you have my utmost for his highest, I encourage you to read that. Read today, read uh, June the 17th. Because he makes a statement in there that Christians, sadly, and I, this is not a perfect quote, but it's a paraphrase, Christians are notoriously, 
parable about criticizing other people. Christians love to criticize. Yeah, Oswald Chambers. So let's go back to what Paul said. Clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. So then let us aim for harmony in the church to try to build each other up. Dear brothers and sisters, 2 Corinthians 13, 11, one more. Dear brothers and sisters, I close my letter with these last words. Be joyful, grow to maturity, encourage each other. Encourage each other. See, people need to be encouraged. Everybody does. In fact, I'll prove it to you. Is there any soul in here this morning who could honestly say, I do not need any encouragement. I am fine, just like I am. Yeah. Everybody. We all need encouragement. Regardless of how together it looks like a person is, they need encouragement. Especially in church, because when people come to church, they all put on their plastic, you know, smile faces. And, you know, they're going to act like a perfect because everybody else is there. <laughs> no, no, that's not true. Nobody's perfect. People just pretending to be perfect. But what we need to do is stop pretending and just say, hey, I'm a sinner saved by God's grace, and I am what I am by the grace of God, and I'm not perfect, but I'm forgiven. And I'm trying by God's grace to get better, see, with his help. Pray for me so I can be better. Now, Paul gives in Romans, in Ephesians 6, rather, instructions for four groups of believers. Well, let's just jump right into it. And by the way, I know this is Father's Day, and I'm very thankful that I had a godly father who encouraged me and who taught me and who loved the Word of God. And I understand that no, no one gets to pick the family they're born into. I got that. I understand that. And so I didn't do anything to deserve my father. I was blessed. God blessed me beyond what I deserved. And I'm very grateful for that. I'm very thankful for that. But today in this message, I want to talk to four groups of people that Paul talks to. And everybody in the room will fit into one of these categories, whether you're a man or not. Okay. Because he starts, first of all, with children. All right, so four groups of believers. First of all, children. Ephesians 6, 1 is a verse that little kids hate to hear all the time from their mom and dad, right? Because we heard it growing up. You are raised in a Christian home. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, right? Did you ever hear that verse quoted to you? It, it didn't you know, usually do a lot of good, did it? <laughs> no. Now that you're an older person, you understand. Watch what he says. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. This is the right thing to do. Honor your father and your mother. And by the way, that part of this command, honor your father and your mother, that's not just true until you become an adult. That's true as long as you are on the earth. Okay? The obey your parents thing, that tends to drop away. I, I got that as young people become adults on their own okay they no longer have are in that category where they are in a you know authority thing with their mom and dad and they got to obey their parents but even if you may not have to obey them as a young adult you always need to honor them you say why because god says so that's the first command with a promise if you honor your father and your mother things will go well with you and you'll have a long life on the earth See, it's God's plan for his word to be passed on from one generation to the next. That's why in Deuteronomy 6, God said what he did about taking his word and passing it on and putting it in front of your children. You know what I remember about my mom and dad's house, among other things? I remember that there were Bible verses, scripture, they called mottos at the time, on the walls all around the house. That impacted me, all right? Because I saw those verses every day. God's primary agent for passing on his word from one generation to the next is the family. But since the fall, the family's been plagued with problems of every sort that weaken, undermine, and threaten to destroy it. 
Now, the first cause of those problems is the sinful nature that we're all born with. And the curse of the fall is built into the family. It's the curse that causes men to be chauvinistic pigs. That causes women to usurp the place of men. That causes children to be disobedient to their parents. That causes parents to be abusive to their children. The fall of man, sin, that's what causes all those things. However, the good news is where Christ is in control as Savior and Lord, a family can live up to the standards and fulfill the ministry that God commands. So there's four reasons that Paul gives here why boys and girls should obey their parents. First of all, number one, they're Christians in the Lord. That's an application of the theme of the entire section, which is submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God, verse 21 of chapter 5. You see, when you become a Christian, you're not released from normal obligations of life. If anything, our faith in Christ should make us better in whatever area we are. Paul said to the Colossians in Colossians 3.20, he said, this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Here's where you get harmony in the home. The wife submits to the husband as unto Christ. The husband loves his wife even as Christ loved the church, and the children obey in the Lord. Number two, because obedience is right. Obedience is right. There's an order in nature, ordains of God, that argues for the rightness of an action. Since the parents brought the child into the world, since they have more knowledge and wisdom than the child, it's right that the child obey his parents. Now, sadly, the modern version of Ephesians 6.1 would be, parents, obey your children, for this will keep them happy and bring peace to the home. Not. Doesn't bring peace to the home. That's the modern perversion, right? That's contrary to God's order in nature. Number three, obedience is commanded. Paul cites, of course, the fifth commandment, Exodus 20.12. He applies it to New Testament Christians. That doesn't mean that the Christians under the law, Christ has set us free from the curse and bondage of the law, Galatians 3.13. But the righteousness of the law is still a revelation of the holiness of God. The Holy Spirit enables us to practice that righteousness in our daily lives. Do you ever notice all the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament except for, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's just as wrong for the New Testament Christian to dishonor his parents as it was for an Old Testament Jew. To honor our parents means much more than simply to obey them. It means to show them respect and love, to care for them as long as they need us, and to seek to bring honor to them by the way we live. By the way, I read an interesting article about why people live longer in many Asian countries, and I'm not trying to stereotype or you know, generalize anything, but this was they pretty good studies on this. One of the big reasons why they said that people lived longer in China and in the, the Asian countries was because there was a greater respect for elderly people in those nations than there is in America. There is in many European countries. That's a sad thing, isn't it? We need to respect. The elderly. By the way, you don't have to be a pastor to do this. I promise you that today, nursing homes across America will be full of, watch this, some visitors who maybe only visit on Father's Day or Mother's Day, but yet, yet, watch. There will be thousands of people, men and women, in nursing homes who get no visitors today. Many men, many fathers will get no visitors today. And there are people that are sitting in nursing homes that get no visitors ever. Ever. They are there alone with four walls. And you could be used of God if God lays this on your heart to brighten their lives just by walking down the hallway with respect to the regulations and rules, of course. But they would welcome you as a visitor, most institutions. And you could stop at the door and just say, hi, how you doing today? You'd be amazed at how many people would welcome a stranger, 
a stranger. And they would love to talk to you and just share their story. And you would, you would, totally change their lives if you did that. I understand that that's hard for some people to believe. You say, I, you know, what, what can I do? You can listen to them because hardly anybody does. In fact, here's, a, here's something that some of you won't believe. There are people who go to churches across America, this church and others, and the only time anybody ever speaks to them is on Sunday morning when they go to church. So what are you talking about? I mean, they go home, and the rest of the week, nobody talks to them. They don't have anybody to talk to. They don't have any friends. The only friends they have are at God's house on Sunday. Now, I understand if you're an outgoing extrovert nut like me, you'd say, oh, that can't be possible. It is. It is. And that's why you and I need to work at showing God's love to everybody and as people walk through the door be sure you greet them see and let them know that you're glad to see them number four obedience brings blessing fifth commandment has a promise attached to it that the days may be long upon the land which the lord your god gives you exodus 20 12. that applied of course to the jews as they entered canaan but paul applied it to believers today it'll be well with him he'll live long on the earth there's two there's two blessings that the Christian child who honors his parents can expect. It'll be well, and he'll live long on the earth. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody who died young dishonored his parents. Paul's stating a principle. When children obey their parents in the Lord, they escape a great deal of sin and danger and avoid the things that could threaten or shorten their lives. Life is not measured only by quality, though, of to- quantity of time. It's also measured by quality of experience. God enriches the life of the obedient child, no matter how long he may live on the earth. Here's a life principle that's not on the, I don't think I put it on the PowerPoint, but you could write this down. Sin always robs us. Obedience always enriches us. That's true. That's not true because I said it. That's true because it's a life principle. That's, that's reality. Sin always robs us. Now, sin promises a lot more than it delivers, but sin always robs. Obedience always enriches. So the child learns to obey their parents and mother and father, not only because they're the parents, but because God commanded it. And what you have today in many homes is the result of rejecting God's word. See? Romans 1, 28 to 30 talks about that, as does 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. See, by nature, a child is selfish. Minnesota Crime Commission, not Christian, okay? Demonstrating the truthfulness of this biblical view issued a report which said, quote, now no disrespect is meant to anybody's baby here today. Let me just give you that caveat, okay? And I didn't say this, the Minnesota Crime Commission did. All right, here we go. Every baby starts life as a little savage. He's completely selfish and self-centered. He wants what he wants when he wants it. His bottle, his mother's attention, his playmate's toys, his uncle's watch, or whatever. Don't deny him these, and he sees with rage and aggressiveness, which would be murderous were he not so helpless. He's dirty. He has no morals, no knowledge, no developed skills. This means that all children, not just certain children, but all children are born delinquent. If permitted to continue in their self-centered world of infancy, given free reign to their impulsive actions to satisfy each one, every child would grow up a criminal, a thief, a killer, a rapist, end quote. You say, oh, I don't like that. That's too, that's too severe. Well, what's God say? God says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now, in the power of the Holy Spirit, a child can learn to obey their parents and glorify God. Number two, Paul talks next to fathers and mothers. Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Now, though pateres, fathers, usually referred to male parents, it was sometimes used to parents in general. Paul was speaking about both parents in the preceding three verses. It seems likely he still has both in mind in this term in verse 4. The same words used in Hebrews 11.23 to refer to Moses' parents. 
because the father was by far the dominant figure in the households of that day. He was the parent who would most often provoke his children to anger. But a mother can do the same thing. She's no more justified in doing it than as a father. See, if left to themselves, children will be rebels. So it's necessary for the parents to train their children. Years ago, the then Duke of Windsor said, everything in the American home is controlled by switches, except the kids. The Bible records the sad results of parents neglecting their children, either by being bad examples or failing to discipline them properly. David pampered Absalom and set him a bad example. The results were tragic. Eli failed to discipline his sons. They brought disgrace to his name, defeat to the nation Israel. In his latter years, even Isaac pampered Esau, while his wife showed favoritism to Jacob. The result was a divided household. Jacob was showing favoritism to Joseph when God providentially rescued the lad and made a man out of him in Egypt. Now, Paul tells us the father has several responsibilities toward his children. First of all, not to provoke them. It's interesting, this, that word in the Greek means do not exasperate them, do not frustrate them. See, in Paul's day, the father had supreme authority over the family. When a baby was born into a Roman family, for example, it was brought out and laid before the father. If he picked it up, it meant he was accepting it into the home. But if he did not pick it up, it meant the child was rejected. This is Roman family. It could be sold, given away, or even killed by exposure. Now, there's no doubt a father's love would overcome such monstrous acts, but they were illegal in that day. Paul told parents, don't use your authority to abuse the child, but encourage and build up the child. To the Colossian believers, he wrote, fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged, Colossians 3.21. So the opposite of provoke is encourage. Now, how can fathers provoke their children? I'm going to give you a quick list. It's not on the notes, all right? You might want to get this tomorrow. Here's, here's some ways fathers provoke their children, discourage them. By saying one thing and doing another. By always blaming and never praising. By being inconsistent and unfair in discipline. By showing favoritism in the home. By comparing them to their siblings. Well, I love that one. Parents will say, why can't you get A's like Bobby does? You know what the answer is? I'm not Bobby. Yeah. No, no, two, no two children are alike. See? Comparing them to the siblings. By pushing unreasonable, often unreachable expectations on the child. You know what's sad about that one? Many parents try to live out their unfulfilled ambitions in the lives of their children. By making promises and not keeping them. By the way, your kids never forget any promise you make to them. They never forget. Now, they'll forget to clean up the room or take out, you know, the trash or whatever, but they will not forget any promise that you make to them. Even years later, they'll remind you of it. By not listening slowly to their children. I love an uh, illustration Chuck Swindoll gave. He said that one time at the meal, his one daughter, was she was rattling on, you know, real fast about something. He said to her, he said, well, honey, he said, why don't you slow down and talk, talk more slowly so I can hear you, so I can understand. She says, well, then, Daddy, you have to listen slowly. Ooh, and he said that hit him right between the eyes because he realized that she knew that while he feigned his attention, oftentimes he wasn't giving it, see. By not listening slowly to the children, by making light of problems that to the child are very important. By using love as a reward or a tool of punishment. By the way, here's a convicting one. Do you love your children the same when they're bad and naughty and embarrass you and do terrible things as you do when they're just model children? Do you love them the same? God loves you and me the same, doesn't he? Yeah, God loves us the same. My Heavenly Father. Well, that's a convicting one to me. I pray all the time and say, God, help me to love other people, not just my children, but other people like you love me, see, whether I deserve it or not, unconditionally. And by the way, Paul says the love of God is shed abroad in your hearts through Christ Jesus, Romans chapter 5. Then we're not only to not provoke them, but to nurture them, nurture them in the discipline and admonition of the Lord. 
The word translated bring them up is the same word that translates nourish in Ephesians 5.29. The Christian husband is to nourish his wife and children by sharing love and encouragement in the Lord. It's not enough to nourish the children physically just by providing food, shelter, and clothing. He also has to nourish them spiritually and emotionally. Jesus Christ as a little boy is our example. Luke 2.52, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Here's balanced growth, intellectual, physical, spiritual, and social. Nowhere in the Bible is the training of children assigned to agencies outside the home, no matter how much they might assist. God looks to the parents for the kind of training the children need. Then he says, discipline them, discipline them. Nurture carries with it the idea of learning through discipline. It's translated chastening in Hebrews 12. Some modern psychologists oppose the old-fashioned idea of discipline. Many educators follow their philosophy. Let the children express themselves, they say. If you discipline them, you can warp their characters. Here's one I just love to hate. Just find the dark spark of goodness, the divine spark of goodness. Every child has one in them. Find that divine, divine spark of goodness and fan the spark of goodness, and they'll be good. And my dad didn't believe that. He fanned something else, man, it wasn't. <laughs> It wasn't the divine spark of goodness. Now, we're not talking, I understand that, you know, I, I walk a line in today's culture when I talk like this because people say, well, you're preaching child abuse. No, I'm not. You don't abuse your children, okay? You should never, never, and this is biblical right here, never discipline your child, whatever method you choose to use, in anger. Don't do it in anger. You know why? It doesn't work. In fact, it produces bad results, opposite results. The anger's bad for you. It's bad for your blood pressure. It's bad for their respect for you. And it doesn't produce the desired results. If we're not disciplined, we can't discipline others. Flying off the handle never has made a better child or a better parent. Our discipline has to be fair and consistent, too. One teenager said, my father would use a cannon to kill a mosquito. Another teenager said, I can either get away with murder or get blamed for everything. Consistent, loving discipline gives assurance to the child. He may not agree with us. By the way, I didn't agree with my dad. You know, I especially agree with the part where he'd say, now, Billy, I know you're not going to believe this. This is going to hurt me a whole lot more than hurt you, see, before he spanked me with a paddle. Yeah, we, my dad used a paddle. He didn't use his hand. It hurt his hand too much, see. He used the paddle. And by the way, I never hated him for it either because he always did it in love. See? I got spanked when I was in school too. Yeah. I did. My last spanking I got in the sixth grade. I remember it to this day. I got it because I threw a snowball through a Bowman's panel truck out at recess. The, the big kids, the eighth graders, I went to Harrisburg Christian School. The eighth graders were throwing the snowballs and missing this Bowman's panel truck, you know, delivery truck. I said, you guys are nuts, man. You don't know how to do it. You got you to gotta lead it. You got to throw it in front. I said, like this. And I threw it in front, and the truck went like this. The snowball went with that, and bam, it hit the truck, but the door was open. It went right in and splattered on the dashboard. Oh, man. My friends all scattered. I was standing there petrified. You know who your true friends are when you're the best jam like that. Man, that driver got out of that thing. He came and grabbed me. He wanted to know where I lived. He was going to call my parents. I said, no, no, they're, they're, they're working at the Harrisburg School uh, Bible Forum. I said, just take me to the school. They'll know what to do in the Christian school right down the street. So he did. He took me to, and she spanked me there. And then when I got home, I got another spanking. Yeah, double jeopardy, I know. And I know it's not fair, but guess what? That's my last spanking. I decided, man, it wasn't worth it, see. Forget it. See. But I knew, watch this, I knew that they did it because they loved me. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard to discipline your children in love. See. A lot of times it'll be a whole lot easier just to 
forget it, you know. Don't do that again, see. And they know that doesn't mean anything. One teen girl said, I never knew how far I could go because my parents never cared enough to discipline me. I figured if it was important to them, why should it be important to me? Then he also has to instruct and encourage them. That's the meaning of the word admonition. See, we not only use actions to raise the children, but words. In the book of Proverbs, we have an inspired record of a father sharing wise counsel with his son. Now, our children do not always appreciate our advice and counsel, but that does not eliminate the obligation we have to instruct and encourage them. And it always, of course, has to be tied to the Word of God, 2 Timothy 3, 13-17. Back in the 60s, when the Supreme Court handed down its ruling against prayer and Bible reading in the schools, the famous editorial cartoonist Herb Block published a cartoon in the Washington Post showing an angry father waving a newspaper at his family and shouting, what do they expect us to do, listen to the kids pray at home? Well, the answer is yes. Yeah. Home's the place where children ought to learn about the Lord and Christian life. You can't just depend upon the church, the Christian school, the Sunday school, the children's church, the youth group to train your children and nurture them. God says it has to start at the home. Then Paul speaks to another group. He speaks to employees. Ephesians 6, 5. Slaves, obey your masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time, not just while they're watching you. As servants of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Work with enthusiasm as though you're working for the Lord rather than people. Remember, the Lord will reward each one of you, us for the good we do, whether we're slaves or free. Now, in context, this refers to the Christian slaves of that day, but we can apply these words to the Christian employees today. There were probably six million slaves of the Roman Empire in that day. Slavery was an accepted institution. Nowhere in the New Testament is slavery per se attacked or dis condemned, although the overall thrust of the gospel is against it. Paul's ministry was not to overthrow the Roman government or any of its institutions, but to preach the gospel and win the loss to Christ. And the results of his evangelism ultimately led to the overthrow of the Roman Empire. But that was not Paul's main motive. Just like the preaching of Wesley and Whitfield, resulted in the abolition of slavery and child labor, the elevation of women and the care of the needy. So Paul's ministry contributed to the death of slavery and the encouragement of freedom. But he did not confuse the social system with the spiritual order in the church. 1 Corinthians 7, 20 to 24. Now, why did Paul tell the servants to be obedient? Number one, they were really serving Christ. By the way, if you're an employee today, this applies to you, okay? Number one, they were really serving Christ. Yes, they had masters according to their flesh, but their real master was in heaven. Now, the fact that an employee and his employer are both Christians isn't an excuse for either one to do less work. Employees need to show proper respect for their bosses and not take advantage of them. He should devote his full attention and energy to the job at hand. The best way to be a witness on a job is to do a good day's work. The Christian worker avoids eye service, which means working only when the boss is watching or working extra hard when he is watching to give the impression that he's doing a very good job. Number two, doing a good job is the will of God. See, Christianity is not divided into the sacred and secular. We don't have a sacred part of our lives on Sunday and then a secular part Monday through Saturday. To the believer, to the child of God, everything is sacred, right? Yeah, it's all sacred. So we do our job from the heart. Do the will of God with singleness of heart. Colossians 3.23, Paul said, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord. H-E-A-R-T-I-L-Y. You know why I, I spell it that way? Some people read it and they hardly, they say, whatever you do, hardly do anything. They hardly do their job. Being a Christian ought to make you a better work, not, a, not less. Number three, they'll be rewarded by the Lord. Ephesians 6, 8, we serve Christ, not men. We receive our rewards from Christ, not from men. And so here's a, here's a convicting question. When you go to work tomorrow, on, on Monday, if you're, if you're employed and work at a job somewhere, can you say, now I'm going to work today as if I were working for God? 
You say, well, my boss is far from God. I got that, but did you hear what Paul just said? If you, no matter how you love your job or don't love your job, and by the way, sadly, more than 50% of all Americans work at a job they hate. I, I don't get that. If I hated this job, I wouldn't be doing it. Say. I would never work at a job I hate. And that probably contributes to a lot of people not, you know, having much diligence at work. But ask God to help you to like it anyway, to love it, and then do your best as unto him, whether for you eat or drink or whatever you do, all to the glory of God, 1 Corinthians 10.31. Now, what's he say to employers? He says, employers, in the same way, be good to your employees. Don't threaten them. Remember that the one who is your master and their master is in heaven. He treats everyone alike. Now, there's responsibilities here of a Christian employer to his workers. Seek their welfare. He says, do the same things unto them. If an employer expects the workers to do their best for them, for him, then he must do his best for them. Not exploit them. One of the greatest examples of this in the Bible is Boaz in the book of Ruth. Boaz greeted his workers with, the Lord be with you. And they replied, the Lord bless you. Ruth 2.4. Boaz was sensitive to the needs of his workers and generous to the stranger. Ruth was a stranger when he was generous to her. His relationship with his workers was one of mutual respect and a desire to glorify God. It's no good when an employee says, my boss is supposed to be a Christian, but you never know it. That's loud. Also, do not threaten. Do not threaten. Roman masters had the power and lawful authority to kill a slave who was rebellious, though few did it. Slaves cost too much money to destroy them. Paul suggested that the Christian master is a better way to encourage obedience and service than threats of punishment, and that was to give respect, to do the best for the employee. If a man shares the results of his labor, he'll work harder and better. Finally, Employers to be submitted to the Lord. Your master also is in heaven. That's practicing the lordship of Christ. The wife submits to her own husband as unto the Lord, Ephesians 5.22. The husband loves his wife as Christ loved the church, Ephesians 5.25. Children obey your parents in the Lord. Parents raise your children in the nurture admonition of the Lord. Slaves obedient as unto Christ. And masters treat their servant as masters in heaven would have them do. So here's what it is. Everyone who is in submission to the Lord has no problem submitting to those over him. Now, you want to be great in God's kingdom? Matthew 25, 21 tells you how. It says, you want to be great in God's kingdom? Learn to be a servant of all. That explains why many of the great men of the Bible were first servants before God made them rulers. Think about this. Joseph served Potiphar and the jailers in the prison where he was unjustly put for 13 years and Pharaoh before God elevated him. Moses served Pharaoh as a young man when he was brought up in his household. Then his father-in-law Jethro watching his flocks and herds. Joshua was servant to Moses before he took Moses' place. David served his father as shepherd boy and King Saul as a harpist and soldier. Finally, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to Artaxerxes. There's just a few examples of people that God had first in places of service as a servant before they became a leader. Even after a man becomes a leader, he leads by serving. An African proverb says, the chief is servant of all. God says, whoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Matthew 20, 27. So a Christian employer cannot take privileges with God simply because of his position. And a Christian employee should not do the same thing either. One of the fastest ways for a leader to divide his followers and lose their confidence is for the leader to play favorites and show partiality. Now, if we're filled with the Holy Spirit, you say, what's that? Well, stay tuned for July 1st. Okay. If we're filled with the Holy Spirit and we're joyful, thankful, and submissive, then we can enjoy harmony in the relationships of life. We also find it easier to work with and witness to the unbelievers who may disagree with us. The fruit of the Spirit is love, and love is the greatest adhesive in the world. So let's say the big idea one more time, all right? Big idea together as we close the message. What's the big idea? 
respect for authority bring harmony? Now here's a convicting question. Are there any authorities in my life? Ask yourself this question. Are there any authorities in my life that I'm not showing proper respect for? Am I willing to ask God to help me to respect those in authority over me so I can promote harmony and be the kind of Christian that God wants me to be? Let's bow our heads and hearts, please, as we close. And before we do anything else, let me ask you a question. If you were to die today, do you know for certain you'd go to heaven, that you have eternal life? Are you a child of God through faith in Christ? Is Jesus Christ your personal Savior? There are a lot of ways to ask that question. There's only one way to answer it, either yes or no. Yes or no. Now, if you don't know for certain that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, You'd say, Pastor Bill, I'd like to know it. And I invite you right now, there where you sit, quietly with our heads bowed and eyes closed, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. If you would like today to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and receive God's forgiveness of sins and eternal life, then please pray this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, just from your heart of heart to God's, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. I ask Jesus Christ now to come into my life. Forgive my sins. Give me eternal life. Make me your child. Thank you for loving me when I didn't love you. Help me now to live my life for you. And tell other people what you've done for me. And how you love them too. In Jesus' name I pray. With our heads still bowed and eyes still closed. If you pray that prayer today for the first time and meant it, would you lift your hand with me right now? By that raised hand you're saying, yes, I prayed that prayer and asked Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior today. One final question before I, I pray. Christian friend. I wonder how many today would say, Pastor Bill, would you pray for me? There's some authorities that I'm having a difficult time with. I'm having a difficult time respecting some authorities in my life, and I'd like to ask you to pray for me that God will help me. I want to do the right thing as a Christian. Here's my hand as a believer. Please pray for me. Would you just slip it up right now? Just be willing to do that? Yes, God bless you and you and you and you and you. Young adults, yes, God bless you. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your long-suffering patience with us. I thank you that you love us even when we are going the wrong way. You don't love what we're doing, but you love us enough to chasten us, to correct us, to draw you, us back to yourself. I pray for any that don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, that today your Holy Spirit would continue to convict them before they place their head on their pillows, that they would accept Christ as their personal Savior. And I pray for these that raise their hands, young adults that are having a difficult time respecting some authorities in their lives, help them. I thank you that you love us all. I thank you that you want to give us the power that we need to respect those in authority over us so we can live the right kind of lives in harmony and peace. And help us to show your love today to people that desperately need it. Help us to look around us on this Father's Day and if we're in a happy family gathering, help us to realize there are a lot of people who aren't. And help us to see how we can show some love to them. Thank you for your blessings. Ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.